Okay, so I've been ending some of my videos with this catchphrase, Paul Romano reporting from the apocalypse, which I find humorous, but also true to a large extent. Now, I don't know if apocalypse is exactly the right word for what we're seeing in front of us because it has a specific biblical connotation. But we are certainly seeing the collapse of our civilization and our culture. And I think that the first rule of surviving the apocalypse is to accept that you're in an apocalypse because I'm going to actually talk about this in another uh, video about the concept of twin flames. But it's really important to know what kind of movie you're in, your personal movie, because that's how people view their lives, how we view our lives through TV shows and movies, maybe to some extent books for some people. But our stories that make up our internal world is makes up the lens in which we view our world. And because we have a lot of stories that are based in the idea of movies, and again, I'm going to talk about this more substantially in this other video today, we have to figure out what kind of movie we're in. And are we in a comeback story or a romantic comedy? And collectively, human beings right now. And right now, we're in a disaster movie. Among other things, you could say it also, it's a horror movie, but we're in the early stages of the pre-apocalyptic story. We're, we just found out there's an asteroid madly rushing towards Earth. And again, like I have a different perspective than most people on this subject that after this period of time, there's going to be a spiritual awakening. There's people in the New Age community that think about this idea of ascension, and then there's the ascension as it's related to the apocalyptic narrative in the Bible. And my understanding of this is that our civilization is, is going to last a certain amount of time, whatever it is, in terms of our debt-based system, where there's food in the grocery stores and you can get in your car and drive places. And when that ends, when they're no longer, you can no longer depend on the system, what I call the beast, there's no longer food in the grocery stores, no longer electricity, this might be something that happens to some people first. It might not be a worldwide collapse, whatever happens. But it'll be like a going out of business of the world culture we have now. There might be some remnants. Somebody has a car battery in their house, you know. <laughs> they can keep things going for a little bit, some solar panels. But for the most part, the system that we now know will just be completely gone. And that's going to happen within... I don't know, 100 years, 200 years, maybe 10 years, maybe five years, maybe next week. <laughs> so maybe that's the second rule of the apocalypse, surviving the apocalypse, or it's 1A, that all civilizations collapse. This is not something that is debatable. There's been many civilizations on this planet. Many of them have been forgotten, and we have no idea they ever existed. We're talking about people being on this planet for probably as long as there were dinosaurs, millions of years, there's been some sort of intelligent life form and there's been civilizations and thus not here in other places in the universe. Whole planets collapse. Whole planets used to be able to inhabit organic life and now they're not or they've been, they're gone forever. They've blown up or something's happened to them. So even whole worlds disappear. So you can see this with like a termite mound where a termite mound will be a great civilization or a beehive and it'll be this wonderful thriving community and then it won't be because everything ends at some point and so we have to accept that now when you have people outside of the truth community that won't accept basic truths that right in front of them because it's too stressful for them it makes them have too much anxiety well, what chance do they have when the whole system collapses? And so this is what I cover here in terms of videos. It's not about waking people up, but it's an acceptance that our system is eventually going to collapse and it's in its collapsing stage, that the human beings are collapsing morally and all these types of things. And all of us are making a choice, my book, The Choice. We're making a choice between whether we're going to move forward and be a part of the solution or help our children and grandchildren be a part of the solution. Something that's better than what we have now, that's more natural, that is based in godly principles and a connection to God and these types of things. 
but it's not about saving this civilization because why would anybody really want to save it? It keeps on getting worse and worse. It's effect on human beings. You look at the way human beings are now and where they were when I grew up and where people were 100 years ago. They were stronger. They were more natural. They were more ethical. They were more moral. I mean, they weren't great then. There were wars or slavery, you know, and now people are just so weak. They can't go to work without their emotional support animal. I mean, the way that people are addicted to electricity, just disconnected from the natural world. And so I want to get into that. The effects of your system on the human being. What kind of human beings is your system producing is the number one factor in determining whether you're in the collapse phase of your time or your civilization's collapse phase. Because, because what we are as human beings determine whether a system is good, whether it's backed by nature and God, whether it's a healthy system. But we're just becoming more and more unnatural and disconnected from what it's like to be human beings. We've become so weak and not what we're meant to be, not what we were designed to be. So that means that the collapse, the apocalypse, is upon us. And these are indications that we can see every day through covering the media, but also in our own personal interaction. So I want to give an example of this. So I go out with my children. We go for a walk at least once a day at some local park. And then once or twice a week, we'll go to a, there's some uh, national parks around us where there's this beautiful nature areas. And we'll go out for a hike in these different places and we ride our bikes off and there's some great bike trails around here or sometimes my kids will just go for a hike and i'll go for a bike ride something like that and the people that go to these parks and these trails i think are on the upper level of human health because they are getting outside but i noticed there was this phase for a while with the pokemon go where all these people started to show up at the park and and there's just always something to do with technology with most of these people. So these are the people that are at least willing to go outside. Some kids, some older people, they're still looking for some fresh air, looking for something that's natural. And yet almost all of them have earbuds in. So they can't be there without some sort of electrical stimulation. And people always have their phones out. And then with this Pokemon Go, it's like, you know, you're out in this, and there's a beautiful park that we have. It's got a nice canyon in it, and there's wildlife rabbits and road runners and quail and all these types of things running around, these little chipmunks. And so you go out in this area. It's fresh, clean air. There's trees and shrubs and wildlife. And if you are disconnected, you don't have any earbuds on, you're actually having a human conversation with your companion, you're not pulling your cell phone out every two seconds, you actually can breathe in and connect to nature. But people are so addicted to their electronic devices, they can't even go out. It's nature isn't enough. This beautiful world with oxygen and color and stimulation isn't enough for them. They have to have a little box and they have to have some little imaginary cartoon character <laughs> that they're collecting something that's on their phone. So they're sitting there and they're like, well, God, you know, nature isn't enough for me anymore. The sound of the stream, the fresh air, the smells of the flowers and the plants, the birds chirping, that just, you know, that isn't doing for me. I have to have this little box in front of me looking for some imaginary little demon that I am collecting. So this is one of the signs of the apocalypse that people no longer fit into their environment. They no longer can be out in the natural environment they used to thrive in. Their habitat is foreign to them. So the other thing is, how are they able to function and perceive reality? Now, when you're riding your bike on a trail where people walk, there's people walking and running on this trail, and they often can't keep in their own lanes. The trail's fairly wide, and I'll say, coming up on your left. And I would say 80% of the people are so compliant that they hear the word left and they immediately move over to the left instead of the right because they're not conscious of these interpersonal dynamics. And oftentimes they're unable to walk in a straight line because, you know, there's other people there you're sharing this, uh, this experience with. But when people have earbuds in and they're looking at their cell phones and they're disconnected from their environment around them, they can't hear correctly. They're just in this other world. 
yesterday we went for a bike ride in the morning and then my daughter cooked dinner and I had a lot of energy and my son didn't want to go. So I went for a bike ride on my own. And it's kind of important that people keep their dogs on a leash for obvious reasons because there's bikers and there's kids. The same thing with their kids. There's people that want to let their kids wander around and they'll be oblivious that there's bikes going by fairly quickly. There's rules on the, there's rules that would govern the interactions that happen there. And I was riding my bike and there's a loose dog and a woman up ahead of me and the service straight away. So I start slowing down and the dog's like right in my lane. The woman's in the other lane and the dog wants to get out of my way. And it sort of head fakes one way and I sort of go that other way and then it head fakes back the other way. And I end up having a jam on my brace because I almost hit the thing. And the woman says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, well, you know, put it on a leash. You are responsible for this animal, and the animal's not trained in traffic, <laughs> in the ability to nav navigate traffic rules. Now, this happens quite often. There's these people that are riding on these trails that, again, these are people that are at least getting out in nature, and they're connecting. And there's a few people that ride their bike, and in one hand, they have their dog on a leash. So they have these one dog, and this, there's another guy, he has two dogs. You know, what could go wrong with that? <laughs> and so they're going through this trail. There's other bike riders. There's people walking and these types of things. And then there's a, I've seen this a few times where there's a person and they have one or two dogs. They're holding their leash with one hand and then holding their hand handlebars with that same hand. They have one hand on their handlebars and the other hand, they have their phone out Why they're riding their bike, checking emails and texts or something looking at their phone as they ride by me. I mean, it's kind of jaw dropping when you think about it because you're doing three things. And whenever you're checking your phone, you're checking your phone, okay? Because this person's walking their dog, riding a bike and checking their phone. But what they're really doing is checking their phone because in that moment when you're staring at your phone and everybody knows this, that when you're staring at your phone, everything else you're doing and everybody else you're around disappears. It's you and your phone. You see this all the time. Somebody, you're having a conversation with somebody, they pull out their phone and they disappear into their phone. And so here's this person doing three things, but actually doing just one thing. And so these people that come and they just ride their bikes and they have their dogs on the leash. I mean, just think about this, you know, how dangerous this is to the dog and other people. So a couple of weeks ago, this guy was riding his bike with his dog and the dog was running off to the sides in various different ways. And as I went to pass him, the dog was on one side of the trail and he was on the other and the leash was between them. You know, I had to basically stop my bike and to, for this guy to get his you know, act together. And then as I rode by him, he put up his hands, like, like throwing up his hands, like, what can I do? And he said, you know, it's the dog. And I said, yeah, clearly it's the dog's fault. He made you put his leash in your hand, put his leash on him, put your bike in the car and come out to this park because it's clearly his decision to have you walk him, <laughs> to have you walk him while you're riding your bike. Because dogs just love that. They love running off to the side and choking or have you slam on your brakes and they get choked or have you ride faster and they have to run to keep up with you. <laughs> they love it. It's a great experience. Every dog wants to be walked while their owner is riding their bike because it makes them feel loved and special. So clearly it's the dog's fault. You had nothing to do with the decision because we live in a collapsing apocalypse and dogs make the decisions on how they get walked. And so there's one final piece to this. So there's the picture I'm going to be using for this whole video. And in this picture, my children and I were walking at a national park near our house. Beautiful place, cathedral of red rocks. You walk in to this valley and you walk, you can go up into these red rocks and you're just surrounded by red rock and it has a certain feel to it. Everyone's been in this kind of a place. It's got a certain peace to it and it's just got this wonderful condition. And as we were leaving the other day and we were coming up the hill, you have to walk up a steep hill to get back to your car. These two guys, these two young guys, again, at least going out to have nature, are walking with some sort of sophisticated boon box and are blasting rap music. So this is a place where there's a lot of people, older people, tourists, 
And it's almost like a natural amphitheater, by the way, that the rocks construct. So this rap music is booming into this natural environment. Now, everybody has to deal with these noises in the city. Everyone has to deal with these noises in their home. But you have this brief period of time where you can't get any cell phone reception. You're away from the electromagnetic poisoning. And these guys, not wearing earbuds, but they couldn't be away from this poison for, I don't know, an hour or two being just out in nature. And so again, another sign of the apocalypse. But what happened before that was to me the biggest sign. So this is where this picture comes in. So we're deep in this, we walk deep into the Red Rock area. So we couldn't see the road, couldn't hear the cars, just surrounded by all this beautiful natural environment. And I looked up and there's somebody that carved something into the Red Rock. Now, of course, you have this situation where people go out deep into nature and they say, you know what, there's this wonderful, majestic natural area, these beautiful trees. I'm going to think I'm going to enhance it. I'm going to I'm going to take out this metal object and I'm going to carve my name here, or my girlfriend's name. I'm going to write something. I was here because the tree won't mind, right? The tree kind of loves that. <laughs> Let's carve it right into its skin so everyone knows that it comes through here that this guy was out in this natural area and decided to deface it. But in this circumstances, this stuff was carved in this, again, this pristine natural area. And somebody had carved into it an Illuminati eye which was not all that stunning to me because this is where people are getting their programming. There's so much of this eye has become a symbol in artwork. You see it showing up more and more in graffiti. You probably have kids doodling eyes now in school because the eye is everywhere. Again, eyes aren't evil, and I've talked about this. The dark societies, the secret societies, the people that govern this planet hijack symbols. Of course, it could be God's eye. I mean, somebody could draw a picture of God's eye with the idea that it's God's watching over you, but that's not what we have. We have this idea of Big Brother watching over you. So you're in this pristine area where you can't get cell phone reception, you're away from all these types of things, and there's an Illuminati eye carved right into the Red Rock. So this is why I'm saying that I'm reporting from the apocalypse, because that is the sign of a collapsing civilization, where these dark symbols are being reproduced by people that really don't even have any idea what they're saying or doing. They're just copying what's been thrust into their eternal worlds. So this is the collapsing phase of our civilization. And the first part is to accept it. We're in the collapsing phase. And hopefully the next phase is going to be better. What do I need to do? What do I need to do to prepare myself and my family and people to move forward through this phase when we can no longer depend on this all-encompassing beast because this happens it's happened throughout human history and it's happening now so what do we do what do you do as a human being what's your specific path to success and so these are the reasons I cover the subject matter I I do here I'm going to talk more about prepping in future videos because I think it's just important but just taking an attitude and the first thing is to accept we're in the declining phase of our civilization it's breaking down all around us and it's going to be unpleasant, but we can move through it and succeed and come out on the other side. So this is Paul Romano reporting from the apocalypse, and everybody have a blessed day.